Three. Okay, and we're recording. Uh, my name is Jonathan Cohn. I'm the chair of the Issues Committee of Progressive Massachusetts. We were intending to go live. There are technical difficulties, but we will still, because of the blessings of technology, be on YouTube in not too long. Um, wanted to talk about the issue of housing, since it's like an especially important, kind of important and often it's like crisis level issue now uh, during the pandemic and the economic fallout and have three wonderful people here to talk with me, uh, with me today. Uh, I have Atel, it's Haji Ai, right? Okay, great. From the Central Mass Housing Alliance, uh, Kelly Turley from the Massachusetts Coalition uh, for the Homeless, and soon to join us, Representative Mike Connolly. Uh, Atel and Kelly, can you just quickly introduce, quickly introduce yourself and tell people what your organizations do? Um, so Central Mass Housing Alliance is um, in, it's, it's housed in Worcester. Um, we are, uh, we focus on homelessness prevention, providing homeless services, um, and doing advocacy around uh, housing issues, affordability, and preventing homelessness. Great, and I'm Kelly, and I work at the Massachusetts Coalition for the Homeless, which is a statewide public policy and direct service organization. Um, we're based in Lynn, as I mentioned, do statewide work to raise up issues related to homelessness, housing, stability, and poverty, and work to create change. Awesome. And then, so uh, an important piece of legislation just passed the legislature today. All bef and before we get to that, I think one question I think would be great to discuss is the state of housing instability that was already the case before everything hit now with kind of with the pandemic and with kind of high levels of unemployment. Can either of you paint a picture of, let's say, looking back to, let's say, before March, what, what was the, the status of housing instability and homelessness in Massachusetts? Kelly, and I'll, I'll fill in for, at least for Central Mass. Sure. Um, so we know that right before the pandemic for a long time, Massachusetts has been facing the twin crises of housing instability and homelessness. Uh, Massachusetts is ranked as one of the least affordable states in the country in terms of costs for renters. Um, last year, or for the current year, it's the third least affordable state in the country. So we're seeing many families, unaccompanied adults and unaccompanied youth that were unable to afford safe permanent housing even before the pandemic hit and now that situation is exacerbated. Um, many people experiencing homelessness in Massachusetts are unable to access shelter which um, Massachusetts is considered a right to shelter state for families with children but in reality the eligibility criteria is so narrow that many families are turned away. Um, by the state's official count more than 40 percent of families are turned away um, but when you really dig into the numbers of how many inquiries they have and how many families actually end up in shelter, um, the numbers are far more um, grim. Yesterday, only three families that applied for shelter were approved, um, and there's an average of 200 families applying each day. Um, so just to give a sense on that front. Um, so many families and individuals experiencing homelessness in Massachusetts are doing so in double up situations, staying with family members and friends. And as we're in the midst of the pandemic where people are asked to stay at home, um, to practice social distancing, many of the hosts for people who are doubled up and experiencing homelessness no longer want to have those additional people in their household because of safety concerns. And so um, families and individuals are really scrambling about what to do because they can't, obviously can't afford a place of their own and they're no longer welcome in the place where um, they have been doubled up. We know in the past that many families experiencing homelessness who didn't have a place to go were showing up in emergency rooms um, because that was considered one of the safest unsafe places. Um, and that obviously is even more unsafe at this point, um, sending families to emergency rooms to seek emergency shelter. Um, so even before the pandemic, we had a real crisis on our hands and we're very concerned that each passing week as more and more people lose their job, lose hours at work, that people are falling further behind on their rent. And I know we'll talk about the eviction moratorium, um, but once that period is up, that we're concerned that many people will be at risk of losing their housing. So working on various policy proposals to make sure that resources are in place so that um, families and individuals can catch up and maintain 
um, their current housing if they are um, fortunate enough to have housing right now. Atel, anything you want to? Yeah, I, I think Kelly captured it um, perfectly. It, it, it was a hard scenario before the pandemic hit um, for, for a lot of families and individuals in shelters and unsheltered. It was already hard to find um, permanent housing, um, permanent supportive housing. Um, you know, with, with now the stopping of construction of already affordable housing stock, that's exacerbating already an existing situation. And like Kelly said, um, the, the need has sort of increased tenfold because now you have a, a whole slew of families and individuals that are potentially at risk for becoming homeless. And we have the same scarce resources available to us now, but with more people and families at risk. So um, I hadn't heard the statistic, Kelly, about the, the most recent one about how many families are applying for shelter, but um, it is, it's heartbreaking to know that, you know, a lot of families are with children are living with the constant anxiety and, and terrifying um, prospect of not finding any housing um, safe and sustainable. And I think one thing that's important for people to realize is if somebody were like, even though Massachusetts has a higher minimum wage than other states, if somebody was working a full-time job on minimum wage, you still pretty much can't afford, afford to like, afford a place in most parts of Massachusetts, or especially the large metro areas. And that's even assuming you have, have that income, as many people now don't. Uh, either you want to talk about kind of that phenomenon of people who are rent burdened. Yeah, I mean, it's very extreme in Massachusetts, even though, as you said, the minimum wage is higher than in most other states. Um, Massachusetts workers are unable to afford fair market rents. Um, the fair market rents across Massachusetts far outpace what people are able to pay with if they don't have a housing subsidy. In fact, often people would have to work two minimum wage jobs in order to afford an apartment that was considered fair market rent. And on top of that, most of the units that are available now to be rented um, are far beyond the fair market rent. So there may be units that somebody's already living in that are at that rent level, but to get a new unit is um, nearly impossible. And um, so we're seeing more and more families and individuals doubling up, tripling up with family members or friends, separating from one another so um, family members can have a floor or a couch to sleep on, um, you know, have some roof over their head. And on top of that, too, the fact that when people think about um, folks being rent burdened, it's not, you know, just the rent. You have utility costs, and then there's the cost of health insurance, and families with children, obviously, many costs. So it is, like Kelly said, is not, not just a matter of the, the rents being inaccessible and unaffordable, and the, the wages not keeping up with their increase, it's the fact too that people have additional costs like utility, gas, and uh, mm -hmm. oil, and all of those things that add up to a family's um, costs. And that reminds me as well as one thing that's also kind of a, a, a problem is how the definition of what counts as affordable for affordable housing is already somewhat flawed. Uh, yeah. Either of you just talk briefly about, about that dynamic as well. Yeah, and so the um, National Low Income Housing Coalition does a report each year called Out of Reach. And so I was referencing that earlier when I was saying that Massachusetts is the third least affordable state. But they're looking at if a household is paying no more than 30% of their income towards rent um, and still have funds available to pay for other basic needs. But we know that many programs um, talk about affordable housing, but it's not for the lowest income people. So there may be subsidies going to households at 80% of the area median income, 100%, 120%. Um, but um, when we're talking about you know, housing for the lowest income families and individuals, trying to make sure there's more resources for households at or below 30%, for example, of the area median income, um, that the, the terms become a bit squishy and um, communities may say, oh, of course we're providing subsidized housing, but it may be um, to you know, public servants, firefighters, police officers, teachers, and not necessarily for um, daycare workers, um, you know, other um, work, people working in the grocery store, you know, for example. Mm -hmm. On top of that, too, you have, you see across communities and municipalities, there's a rush to create more luxury housing. And so what that's doing is then taking 
necessary stock, especially when for municipalities that the uh, naturally reoccurring affordable housing stock is expired, um, is just creating more pressure for precious housing stock to then be completely inaccessible to the lowest, most vulnerable um, people that need it the most. And so that on a policy level, uh, at the city level, at the state level, that's just something that's just exacerbated the crisis even more. Mm -hmm. And then I'll welcome uh, Representative, State Representative Mike Connolly, who just joined. Hey, good afternoon, Jonathan. Good afternoon, everyone. It's, it's yeah. great to be here from, from my bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And so uh, now that, like, that you, you've joined us, I think we can just to quickly transition that an important piece of legislation just passed uh, in the state legislature today with a, a moratorium on evictions and foreclosures during the kind of the state of emergency. We'd love to hear a little bit more about what does the bill do, as well as the important question of what still needs to be done beyond it. Absolutely, well, yeah, thanks for having me. You know, it's an honor to be here um, with Edel and with Kelly. And uh, the legislation uh, just passed the state Senate um, a little less than an hour ago, uh, passed the House just before that. So it's on its way to the governor. And it is, as you described, Jonathan, an eviction and foreclosure moratorium. And to my knowledge, it's actually the first of its kind uh, in the nation. Uh, many other governors or uh, other judicial branches around the country have implemented uh, pieces of an eviction moratorium and a foreclosure moratorium. Uh, but this bill was really an across the board uh, moratorium done in a comprehensive way and i did some research last night and yeah to the best of my knowledge it, it seems like this um is the first legislative effort of its kind and you know it's a credit i think we should mention um early in the conversation it's really a credit to the housing justice organizers and the legal services attorneys um who really raised this issue and governor baker declared the state of emergency back on March 10th, and within hours of that declaration, uh, City Life Theater Urbana and Right to the City Boston and numerous other groups, Chinese Progressive Association, Len United, um, they called for the eviction moratorium. I actually found out about it. I got a Facebook invite. So those of you who know me know I'm, uh, I'm no stranger to social media. So when I saw the invite, that was kind of my cue. I thought, okay, I, I should get to work on this. I want to start drafting um, legislation. So I um, got to work on it within hours, reached out to housing chair Kevin Honan, um, brought him in. He was very supportive. Together, we filed a bill on March 13th and 73 legislators co-sponsored it, and certainly it had the strong support of groups like the Massachusetts Community Action Network. I'm sure, I think Progressive Massachusetts must have been mm -hmm. supportive. So we built up a um, great deal of momentum right out of the gate. And you know what we called for in the bill and, and what this legislation does, it's an across the board moratorium on evictions. And that's really important. You know, the courts right now have a standing order that sort of puts a pause on like one slice of the eviction process, but notices to quit have still been issued. Uh, levies on execution have still been um, available. And there's all these other pieces along the way of an eviction process that have still been active. And in this moment of, you know, COVID-19 pandemic and emergency, you know, the continued activity in the eviction process is really a matter of life and death. You know, let's be real clear about it, because if you're someone who is at home right now, and maybe you have the symptoms of COVID-19, and you get a notice to quit, you know, telling you you have to produce um, a certain amount of money that you might not have, or else you're going to lose your housing, I mean, you're going to be, you know, tempted and, and probably persuaded to go out to your job and to continue interacting with people and then, you know, risk potential transmission of this virus. So um, we were really grateful to see that, you know, there was um, strong support from the state Senate as well. We really took up the charge. 
So that's the uh, eviction moratorium piece. There's also a foreclosure moratorium piece um, that similarly applies to you know, all the different key steps of the foreclosure process. Uh, the bill also um, will apply to small business evictions. And in the definition of small business, the legislation also includes local nonprofits. Um, so that's certainly, I think, important uh, as we try to maintain community stability. I know we can't count on Donald Trump or the Republicans in Washington to necessarily implement programs that are actually going to help small businesses. So this is, you know, one piece. Um, and I could go on and on. I'll, I'll just give you a couple other quick highlights. It also um, would um, allow a tenant who is impacted by COVID-19 to avoid negative credit reporting or to avoid late fees. And there's even um, an option in there that will allow landlords to draw on last month's rent. And this would only be in cases where landlords have a certain financial obligation. So it wouldn't actually be tied to a tenant's payment of rent. But in a case where a landlord has either a tax bill or a maintenance you know, obligation or a mortgage payment, that last month's rent is just sitting there. The landlord's already paid it. I mean, excuse me, the tenant has already paid it. And the tenant would be held harmless. They're still good for their last month's rent. They wouldn't have to do anything to replenish those funds. But uh, a landlord could actually draw on those funds and meet that obligation. And as a matter of fact, the bill even obligates the landlord to pay interest on that last month's rent as if they had never touched it. So it's certainly, um, as you can see, I think it's something we can be pleased with. Um, it really addresses all different concerns, whether it's renters, homeowners, landlords, small businesses. So that's the bill in a nutshell. Um, you want me to move on to some next things? One, one quick thing while we're talking about evictions. Uh, what are the, what's the current state of tenants' rights in Massachusetts, right? So I know one thing that you have an issue on the local level is that many municipalities can't really pass ordinances doing too much on a tenant's rights perspectives because of the home rule system in Massachusetts. But like, what protections do exist for tenants already in Massachusetts? If anybody wants to chime in. Um, I'll certainly invite others, but you know, I'll, I'll just say briefly in the beginning, I think on one hand, we do have a wide range of you know protections and rights generally in terms of forestalling an eviction. But the key is, and this gets to legislation that I, I'm sure you support, mm -hmm. um, if you don't have legal counsel, the ability to exercise what rights you do have, um, you know, is, is nothing you can really count on. So certainly the right to counsel legislation is something I would love to see us do before the session ends. But um, do others want to chime in as well? Or should I just keep going? <laughs> I mean, just to say that the right to counsel legislation is a piece that the Coalition for the Homeless also strongly supports and has been working on. We know that once a tenant gets to housing court, it's um, almost always they'll be ruled against if they don't have any representation. And there are lawyers for the day that a tenant can meet up with at housing court, but that's very little prep time to really defend themselves in, in that situation. And so in addition to making sure that tenants have a right to counsel and um, support for tenant advocacy groups. We also want to make sure that there are resources for households to pay that back rent so there is no further obligation on their part to the landlord. Um, and so working to strengthen programs like the Residential Assistance for Families in Transition program, um, which provides funds for back rent, back utility bills, startup costs for apartment. There was a recent infusion of $5 million into that fund um, to help households impacted by COVID-19. But we know that once the moratorium ends, that there are going to be tremendous needs. And so we're advocating for a $50 million infusion into that fund to really make sure that the lowest income tenants and homeowners um, have the resources to pay back financial obligations that uh, at this point aren't scheduled to disappear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the only thing I would add to that is that the, the RAF program that Kelly just referenced and strengthening the housing counseling agencies which essentially provide that um, ability for mediation between tenants and landlords and trying to keep everybody out of the system 
uh, it, it's that adds to the sort of to the larger picture of preventing um, not only in supporting tenant rights but also working with landlords to make sure that we're not losing that housing stock that's so precious right now and so that 50 million infusion is something for raft it's something that probably um has, has gotten the support of a lot of housing agencies and advocates and it's going to be so important to to make sure that even at the federal level that we're advocating for more um you know bigger numbers in terms of the rental assistance that comes for uh, for our families and individuals. And then kind of thinking about the here and now before we go forward, I know that April 1st had been a major date when it comes to housing because of how many people have rent due on April 1st. Was there anything that you were hearing on the ground from people about say, like people who had just lost their, lost their jobs and then like had the, kind of the struggles that people were facing as like another, another month's rent was due within like a, a particularly terrible economic and unstable economic climate? I would say probably one of the things that that we have heard the most is just uncertainty. What happens in terms of what are my rights under COVID? Can a landlord even threaten me? I mean, even just putting a notice to say you need to pay your rent has caused major anxiety. And especially if you're an undocumented person, um, if you have other barriers, it just the, the by virtue of not having the information and knowing what are your protections has caused just a lot of anxiety. Um, you know, Kelly mentioned $5 million for raft infusion for housing counselors to do homelessness prevention. You know, just the mere fact that our caseworkers are working remotely, uh, processing this, this complex documents, even with some flexibility, um, it's just, it, it's just not enough. It's not, it's not enough to um, meet the, the current need, let alone the the, the onslaught of families and individuals that are going to need more support. So that's sort of like the picture that we're seeing on the ground, at least where I live. Yeah, and I would add that we expect the situation to get much worse as May 1st approaches. There were um, tenants that we've been working with that did have funds set aside to be able to pay for April, um, but now May is very uncertain. Um, the agency that administers the RAF funds in the Boston area released some numbers around inquiries for this program um, leading up to April 1st. And you see a huge spike in requests as the April 1st rent date came, but expecting as um, you know, we've been talking about a greater onslaught of need and um, people looking for assistance come May 1st, June 1st and on. Mm -hmm. Sure. And if I can just add, you know, uh, touching on your earlier question, Jonathan, mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, maintaining, maintaining tenancies long term and stabilizing rents long term, there are very few protections. And, you know, that's why uh, Rep. Algardo and I and others have advanced this Tenant Protection Act mm -hmm. um, as general legislation. But again, sort of if you're in that position where you're trying to hold on to your tenancy for another month or another couple months, then if you have a, an attorney um, who's well resourced, you can, you know, access the courts um, and try to hold on. But, um, you know, I'll also share, and maybe the segues into the other part of your original question. Um, prior to the, you know, we had assumed that the uh, moratorium would pass even more quickly. Although, you know, to be sure by legislative standards, this was lightning speed, <laughs> um, five weeks. Um, but we had actually assumed maybe we'll get it done in three or four weeks. And so uh, I actually started working with some folks from City Life and from uh, GBLS and others on draft legislation around a rent freeze. Mm -hmm. um, and people can actually go online and check that out at rentfreeze.org. Um, and if you actually visit that page, there's a petition and that actually connects into a, um, the housing guarantee petition that a lot of the uh, frontline housing groups are organizing as well. And sort of the impetus around the rent freeze idea, and you know, to be clear, I mean, the terms rent freeze, rent cancelization, um, they can mean different things. So people use them in different ways and they might mean different things. But one of the things that, you know, in talking with some of the attorneys that I found interesting was, 
you know, the, uh, the tenant landlord relationship to pay that debt is really a contractual relationship. But the eviction process is really sort of a different legal process relative to who has an interest in property and who has access to property. And so, you know, we have some limitations around interfering with contracts, although there's probably uh, a longer constitutional law discussion about that. But I think we're a little bit more, certainly much more, uh, you know, free to define what is an eviction or what isn't an eviction. And so in the rent freeze proposal that um, I've been drafting, and it's, it's still a draft, what we essentially say is to the extent a tenant is unable to pay rent as a result of COVID-19 during this emergency, that inability to pay rent will never be recognized as the basis for uh, an eviction. Um, and that's sort of the main concept. Like any bill, there's seven or eight other ideas there. And it's certainly something we're gathering feedback about. And I think we need to hear what people think. But it's just, you know, one notion of how can we stabilize tenancies? Because as I think you've alluded to, uh, doing this moratorium is so essential and it's step one. But it's not going to be good enough if, you know, three months or one month after the emergency ends, we have a wave of evictions and displacement. And so certainly that's the next challenge that we need to work on. And then so before we talk a little bit more about like the next steps that we need, one thing I'm curious to hear. So we're talking about the issues faced by people who are currently housed and but at risk of losing, the, losing their housing. Yet Massachusetts also has a fairly large population of people who are experiencing homelessness and who, who don't have a, like a safe place to shelter in, in the first place. Um, does anybody, can anybody speak for a little bit about what, po what policies are currently in place to help those who currently don't have a place to, to safely shelter and what needs to, needs to kind of pretty much immediately happen to address that? Yeah, I can talk to that. We are really concerned because there are so many people in Massachusetts who are experiencing homelessness and don't have the opportunity or ability to stay at home during this emergency. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about the state's emergency shelter system for families. Um, there are shelters for unaccompanied youth, for unaccompanied adults, for families with children, but they're not to scale. They're uh, generally full uh, on the family side. Family has to be approved by the state itself and get placed. And so many people are excluded from that system already. But for those families and individuals who have been able to access emergency shelter, one of our major urgent concerns right now is making sure that there's the ability to de-densify, um, depopulate those um, congregate shelters because we know that having people in tight quarters, sharing bathrooms, sharing kitchens, sharing common areas um, is going to accelerate the spread of this virus. Um, there's research that was uh, done by at Boston Healthcare for the Homeless that's been um, in the news around high numbers of people in congregate shelter settings who were asymptomatic but ultimately tested positive um, for COVID-19. And so we know that that's also happening in other shelters, but the testing isn't happening at this point. Uh, we've been pushing the governor, pushing the legislature to make sure resources are available so that families and individuals can be placed in units that are separated from other households. So, um, you know, the most likely um, place where families could be and individuals could go would be hotels and motels. They're only supposed to be used right now for vulnerable populations or for medical needs. Um, the state previously had almost 2,000 families placed in hotels and motels, using them as part of the emergency shelter system. As of last night, there were only 12 families placed in motels through the state's um, family shelter program. Um, there are hotels and motels being used to provide shelter for people experiencing homelessness right now during the pandemic, but it's just for people who've tested positive for COVID-19 or have a known exposure um, and they're presumed to have COVID-19. Um, we're not proactively providing spaces mm -hmm. for families and individuals to have the safe spaces to um, practice social distancing and 
we're very concerned working with families on the ground who are really terrified. We know that people experiencing homelessness are disproportionately likely to have other underlying health conditions that would mean that if they do contract COVID-19, it's going to have much worse um, repercussions on their long-term health and ability to stay alive. And so we've been trying to emphasize over and over again with the Department of Housing and Community Development, with the governor's office, with the governor, that action needs to be taken today. It should have been taken a month ago, but we can no longer wait to de-densify the shelter system. Um, I know that as part of the governor's press conference today, he was going to talk a bit about some of those plans, but um, and we hope that they're concrete and we hope that they're swift, but from what I'm hearing that it's still not, um, the, the response isn't to the scale of the need and the sense of urgency that um, people experiencing homelessness need the state to take this crisis seriously. We know it's a public health emergency, we know it's a housing emergency, and we can't leave people, um, continue to leave people in unsafe places. The only thing I would add to that is, is that, you know, you have these two parallel tracks that are, are just waiting to collide, and that is what Kelly was just talking about. You got the families in emergency shelters that are living in congregate settings or co-shelter, you know, sharing space. And then you have um, individuals who's now the rate of those who are asymptomatic, uh, who are being tested positive is getting higher because we're testing more people. There, there is no universal testing, however, for, for families. So we're sort of working blind and going, going on the assumption that, that we're not seeing cases, but that's only because folks are not getting tested. And so when you combine both how do you de, um, depopulate shelters and also how do you take care of homeless individuals that are currently in city shelters with the, with the idea that there's no units available to find anywhere um, because there are no units available for folks to move into, um, if we need those hotels and motels. Like there's, there, is, there is no capacity on municipalities to keep folks in schools and gymnasium, gymna gymnasiums. Um, and th those are not appropriate spaces for families either. So what Kelly spoke about is the sort of the advocacy that needs to happen now, not when we actually do see the numbers mm -hmm. of the testing. Yeah, or if, I, if I can add to that, I mean, first of all, thank you. Uh, for those comments because you know that, that's just so important to be heard and you know frankly i i think mask you know the governor has failed already you know and, I, and i've talked a lot on twitter um that the massachusetts civil defense act this is the legislation that empowers the governor to act in a state of emergency it says that the governor will have any and all power necessary um or you know expedient over persons and property to meet the state of emergency all power you know and so i think we all had a learning curve with covid you know i, I remember the first i heard they said well it's kind of like the flu and most people don't get sick so you know a couple months ago i was thinking you know okay covid 19 and we were, you know, President Trump didn't do us any favors, and I shouldn't have even called him president. Mm -hmm. um, the occupant of the White House didn't do us any favors when, you know, he downplayed the, um, the risk from this. But, you know, at some point, you know, you realize the logic of this terrible virus, that it will exponentially grow, and that for every person who catches it, they're liable to uh, infect several other people. And it doesn't take long until you put together the logic and you realize that these congregate settings and people who don't have housing, uh, access to housing or housing stability need a place to go. And so really it should have been weeks or more than a month ago now that I would have liked to have seen the governor just you know, say, you know, this hotel, that vacant unit, this place, that place, just start saying, you know, these people, you know, you get this housing, over here, you can go over here, like take action, make decisions. Um, and we haven't seen that, you know? And so it's, it's really, uh, it's scary to think where we may be headed, um, but it's, it's such an important concern, you know? And there's a similar concern for people who are incarcerated. Um, and we also are concerned about uh, undocumented immigrants. You know, these are groups that we've struggled 
to get justice and get recognition for them on Beacon Hill. And now uh, it's a life or death situation. Mm -hmm. And so one thing when talking about making sure that people get housed, and this should, since like I live near so many hotels, so that I'm using hotels in my mind. Are any have any city have any cities been proactive at trying to get additional spaces, like, like units for the populations in their cities experiencing ho homelessness? Like what is what can what can be done at the municipal level as like as wait as cities and towns wait for state action? Uh, well, I can start with just sharing a little bit from Cambridge. Uh, a real um, big effort has been made to uh, create a space for people experiencing homelessness in Cambridge. But again, I think what we saw as this effort was made was not really a complete understanding of what we were facing. And so the initial plan was to take the War Memorial Gymnasium down at Cambridge Ringe and Latin and set up cots uh, six feet apart and invite um, people who need shelter to just come into a giant gymnasium and have everyone stay there. And that really raised, you know, serious concerns for advocates in the city um, and for several city councilors. And, you know, again, my position has been Harvard, MIT, different hotels, different vacant apartments um, ought to be utilized. Uh, I can say that there's been some progress in the last 24 hours, at least in the plan I just described. And what the city of Cambridge is now going to do is continue with that sort of congregate setting model, but they're going to do the instant um, COVID testing before someone gets admitted um, into that um, sort of congregate setting which I still don't think is necessarily ideal, but it's certainly um, a big step forward on just sort of having, you know, a large group of people who haven't even been tested all sharing the same space. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's the Cambridge situation. And the final thing I'll say about this is, you know, Cambridge is more well-resourced than many countries in this world. <laughs> so, you know, if that's the Cambridge situation, I know from talking to my colleagues, you know, whether you're in Pittsfield or Northampton or other parts of the state, the situation is a lot more dire um, than what we have here right now. Yeah, I can add that for for Worcester, um, I think that our city has, has done an amazing job at responding super quickly to the needs of unsheltered um, individuals. And so we have four or five sites where folks are staying. Um, again, this is putting a huge strain though on, on you, you, it's just not, it's not a sustainable solution. It, it's a temporary solution to get people who need uh, to be tested, who are asymptomatic to get tested. Um, and then to also on top of that, figure out how do we feed people? How do we connect to the resources that they already have connected, but now, you know, all of us in the nonprofit world are, are working from home. So there's a huge effort underway to take care of that, what I was describing as a parallel sort of um, problem with the, with the individuals um, and, and sort of like, what is the role of FEMA in leveraging resources like opening hotels? At the same time, homelessness is not just individuals, right? We, the majority of folks are families with children currently housed in, uh, in temporary, in, in emergency shelters. On that end, like Kelly was hinting earlier, it, it's very challenging because um, sort of the guidance that we're getting is from the state is to, to try to depopulate folks using our already existing portfolio and then sort of go on a case by case basis. Uh, again, I don't think that's a, that is a sustainable solution for long term purely because of the number of families and bodies there are in, in a congregate setting that need to be separated and social distanced. And the fact that we don't know um, because there is no universal testing for, for family shelters. And so our city is under a lot of strain and pressure. So what you, what you have is conversations going on, for instance, where folks are getting together and saying, well, for the homeless individuals in shelters right now, we have a space for women and single parents, for instance, separate from the, a co-ed setting where it may not feel safe and you've got domestic violence survivors and so there's a, a complexity of issues that cannot be addressed by having spaces that are temporarily 
um, addressing the issue of getting folks out of the street into a safe space. Yeah, and we're seeing that it's been really a patchwork of responses and we can't rely on cities and towns to have the resources or the ability to quickly mobilize to be able to create the spaces necessary to address the um, severity of the crisis. We're grateful that many cities and towns have brought on capacity in gyms, sports facilities, college campuses, former hospitals. Um, but most of those spaces are for people who already are showing symptoms um, or have a positive diagnosis. And um, you know, the spaces in Cambridge that um, Rep Connolly talked about and some other cities and towns can be accessed by people who may not have any symptoms. Um, but in general, we're waiting for people to show symptoms to get a positive diagnosis before they can even access temporary shelter. And um, the urgency of making sure there's a systematic statewide response um, is huge. And it's been frustrating from the advocacy perspective um, that we haven't been able to get this um, leadership in the state, the Baker administration, to really focus on this issue. I know that there's a lot for them to focus on right now, but it's life or death for people experiencing homelessness. Um, you know, we talked about many people have underlying health conditions so that if they contract COVID-19, it really could be fatal for them. Um, and there's, there is a complexity, but there's also a simplicity that we know that we have the capacity to put people in places like hotels and motels. We have the money to do that um, and we should do it now. And then so to go back to a point that we were just discussing uh, before of the like, what, the what next, right? So we just, this, the legislature passed uh, and hopefully soon Governor Baker will sign that, that moratorium on evictions and for, on foreclosures. Once that, once that moratorium, um, like the moratorium is just a, a temporary stoppage. And so like once that ends, there's still plenty of housing instability and perhaps even let's say as unemployment continues to grow and things continue could be like the situation for many people could be even worse by that point what are some of the things that we can do proactively uh to prevent let's say like a i would say a disaster scenario when the when the more when, when the moratorium uh like the, when it's like end date comes to pass uh I can take it, but certainly don't. I, I took the last one first, so, but I'm happy to go. Well, who should take it, Jonathan? <laughs> Let's say, I'll say, I'll call in a tell. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think the things that we talked about as making sure that that raft money um, is more than $5 million, so the $50 million uh, dollar amount that Kelly talked about, making sure that that comes through the pipeline. Um, you know, certainly I know that there's different bills at the state house about increasing the cash assistance uh, to families and individuals to stabilize even more. We know the CARES Act uh, funds are going to be available to some. So for our undocumented um, community, I think it's going to be important to make sure that we have state funds available and sustained assistance. Um, I think that long term, we just need to keep not losing sight of the fact that we need more affordable housing for our lowest um, income uh, renters. Um, and when construction starts again, when it's safe, and when we are back to working around municipal bills, things like inclusionary zoning, making sure that we're passing CPAs in communities um, for additional rental assistance, like we're not losing sight of those long term policies that um, advocates have been working on at the state level, but also uh, at, the, at the municipal level. And then Kelly, um, if you want to, if you want to chime in. Yeah, I would just add in terms of the, the raft program, one of the important changes that we were able to make progress on this year with the legislature um, is around when a household could access the funds. Before this year, a household had to already be in housing court before they could get assistance to pay for back rent. And so we've been advocating for upstream access to that program. Um, we are grateful that the Department of Housing and Community Development agreed to undertake a pilot program this year. The legislature formalized that and put more funds towards it. Um, and these, the $5 million in additional COVID-19 funds can be accessed in a more upstream way. Uh, but we have to make sure that 
low income renters, low income homeowners can access the resources they need before having to go to court, before having to go through the eviction or foreclosure process. Um, it's better for the tenants, it's better for our communities, it's better for the landlords and the banks. Um, but too often we wait till something gets to a crisis level before we provide um, any resources. So really shifting the mindset to be more preventative, to be more upstream is really critical. And I think that this crisis has underscored that each day. Mm -hmm. And then Mike, any, anything you wanna add? Uh, absolutely, well certainly would uh, agree with uh, everything that was just said and, and really just underscore the fact that, you know, I think we need a movement for housing for all. You know, one of the things that I've noticed um, in my years now as an activist and now as a legislator is we often build up movements around a particular policy objective or a particular um, program. And we bring a bunch of people together and we fight for it and maybe we win, maybe we lose. And then, you know, a year later we start over with the next objective and that's fine. But you know, the, the model that I've been excited by, and I think it's exciting to see sort of the Homes for All Coalition in Massachusetts start to come together, um, and it's something I'm really psyched to be a part of, is really saying that, you know, let's set the goal at the very top and say every human gets housing, and then build our advocacy and build our organizing um, in a very sort of uh, broad way and then deploy it in a, you know, a tactical way. So one day it might be pushing for a bill on Beacon Hill. The next day it might be helping to elect, you know, a city council candidate. The next day it might be advocating for an affordable housing project. Um, and there's all different ways we can do it. So that's certainly one thing. Another thing we have to do, I think, is, you know, take a step back and realize, and, you know, Jonathan, we've talked about this before, we're in a state of austerity. We've been in austerity in Massachusetts for two decades now. And it's um, terrifying to think that that's where we were before COVID started. And now we're in COVID and it's hard to even know when there will be light at the end of the tunnel. Um, but to sort of put it, you know, to put an example out there, the MRVP program, right, is the flagship um, housing voucher program in Massachusetts. As I understand it, the predecessor of MRVP was sort of a model that I think influenced the Section 8 program nationally. Like so many things in Massachusetts, it was an example of an idea that was really um, born in our state. The MRVP program, as I understand it, 30 years ago, um, funded about 20,000 housing vouchers in Massachusetts. And today, um, that number is uh, less than 9,000. It's somewhere in, you know, certainly way less than 10,000. I see Kelly nodding her head, um, around 9,000. So you think about that. Let's think about that for a second. 30 years ago, we had an economy that worked better for working people. We had rent control in Massachusetts 30 years ago. We weren't the subject of global financial speculation that's driving up the cost of real estate and making housing uh, inaccessible to people. And at that time, we funded 20,000 housing vouchers. Today, that number is, you know, cut in half. And then take that, you know, put that on a chart, then put family homelessness on a chart. And what you will see is that the, as the austerity has, you know, um, made its impact, family homelessness doubled in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts over the past decade. And again, those are figures prior to COVID-19. And so, you know, the answer, um, you know, on a couple of levels is, you know, continued organizing and doing what we're doing right here, sort of uh, sharing knowledge and, and allowing people to understand what's going on. And then of course, you know, we have to um, go to those who have all the resources, have all the wealth, um, those, you know, billionaires, those multimillionaires, you know, the big institutions in our state and say, you're going to have to contribute to the solution. Um, one of the things that has been really um, exciting for me to witness is, you know, in Seattle and also in San Francisco, there have been movements to tax large uh, corporations and then use those funds to inject hundreds of millions of dollars just on the city level 
to addressing homelessness. San Francisco did a ballot question uh, called Proposition C a couple of years ago. It got nearly 60% um, of the vote in support. And the idea was to put a small tax on large corporations and then to put hundreds of millions of dollars into affordable housing. I'll just give a plug. I actually have a bill modeled on that San Francisco proposal. Uh, it's called House Bill 3887, an act facilitating housing for all. Um, with so much going on, I think we're still, you know, we filed this bill uh, at the start of the current session. Um, I think it's been a little overshadowed by the Tenant Protection Act, which has really been um, our top sort of general legislative priority. But I would just certainly emphasize that, that at the end of the day, you know, um, in a city where the average family of color has a net worth of $8, we can't expect the market to provide the housing that people need. And so we're going to need aggressive and ambitious government interventions to um, gather the resources and the supports we need to allow people to be housed. And the COVID emergency, I think, is just revealing how desperately urgent this has been all along. I think the, the budget issue that you mentioned is especially important as you kind of we're seeing reports about how the state might be losing a lot in tax revenue given the kind of the economic recession that could even soon be a depression. But it's in that case, it's especially vital to make sure that such programs don't end up on the chopping block because they need even more money than they're already being granted and can't right. like, do even the basics of what they're expected to do with even less money than they currently have. Absolutely, yeah. And I mean, I think, you know, we're sort of in, we had a luxury prior to this where, you know, we could, um, you know, debate these things easily. Now we're in sort of a day, you know, a one day at a time it's life or death every day trying to figure out how we help people. Um, so yeah, we have to, you know, continue to try to get through this, but hopefully never lose sight of how we wound up so terribly vulnerable. And hopefully, you know, um, I mean, I'm no scholar of history, but it seems like, you know, change doesn't always happen on a linear line, right? Like a lot of times there are these things that happen and they shake people. And then, you know, like out of the Great Depression, we had the New Deal. I mean, let's hope that we can find a way to um, emerge from this terrible crisis in a way that, you know, provides housing to all people as a human right. So one final thing before I, I don't take all of you, all, too much time from all of you is there had at, at the beginning of the session or into it, there was talk about maybe the legislature would pass some type of like, comprehensive housing uh, housing bill. That seems like it's at least in the next month not going to happen in the legislature. But when the legislature ends up getting back to normal and functioning, and that there's time to think more of long term what we need to do, what are some core provisions that you think has to have to be a part of any bill to like any large scale bill to address what housing looks like in Ma and affordable housing looks like in Massachusetts? And then since Mike just ended, I'll, 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 I'll let Kelly start. Yeah, I would say that we have to make sure that any comprehensive housing bill ensures that there's housing for the lowest income families and individuals. We talked before that sometimes affordable housing is used as a term, but we're really talking about housing for people making 80 or 100% or 120% of the area median income. And we know that housing instability and homelessness impact every region of the state, every community, all 351 cities and towns. And we can't just leave it to a handful of cities and towns to provide housing to the lowest income residents of Massachusetts. So making sure that every community has the obligation to ensure that there's housing affordable to the lowest income families and individuals is should be at the basic level. And um, as Representative Connolly said multiple times, recognizing that housing is a human right. It cannot be considered a commodity. We have to make sure that every family, child, elder, person with disabilities um, has access to housing. We know that both the COVID-19 pandemic and housing instability and homelessness are disproportionately impacting immigrant communities and communities of color. And as we move forward, any comprehensive housing legislation, we have to make sure that the needs of those communities are at the forefront. Excellent. And then say, Atel, any thoughts that you have of things you would want to make sure get in any uh, general, like 
omnibus housing legis legislation? I think all of what um, what Kelly mentioned and Mike as well, I would say too that, you know, when we think about homelessness or housing instability, we shouldn't just be thinking it in just in a singular way. We should be thinking about making sure that our safety programs are as robust as ever, um, mm -hmm. making sure that it's about jobs. So any economic development initiatives in cities and municipalities need to be driven by the needs of those most vulnerable. Uh, communities of color, undocumented refugee communities are impacted the most and disproportionately. And, you know, making sure that when we're also thinking about housing, that we're, we're saying also sustainable, healthy, uh, green housing, right? Mm -hmm. So we have an opportunity to sort of meld all these policies together um, so that families are not put in just housing for the sake of getting them out of shelter, but that there's there's ways that we can sustain their well-being by having a holistic look at jobs, job growth, um, wealth distribution, uh, inclusionary zoning, inclusive policies that put first and foremost the needs of those most impacted. And, and then Mike, any final, final comments on this? Uh, well, certainly, you know, the fact that we're talking about a comprehensive housing bill, I think, is a victory, you know, in its own right, you know, because that's been um, I think for a long time, it was just, we need a housing bill, Governor Baker has a bill. We need a housing bill, Governor Baker has a bill. Um, and I think there are things we can work with, um, with the governor. But what I'm really gratified to see, I think, is over the past two years, um, the tenants' rights movement has sort of um, found a place at the table on Beacon Hill. So what I'm looking for in a comprehensive housing bill would be, you know, smart regional housing production, strong tenant protections, um, big new progressive revenue, as we just discussed, uh, and a, you know, a commitment to housing as a human right. And that would mean housing for all um, and doing everything we can um, to you know, not have people experiencing homelessness in our state. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, again, I want to thank, thank all, of you for, all of you for joining and apologies for the technical difficulties at the start. Before we leave, can you can each of you just say for people who are interested in learning more about the, the amazing work that you're doing, how can they how can they stay connected and, and, and learn more? So well, I'll make a plug for our annual Walk for the Homeless that's happening in Worcester to support all of our programs. This year it's a virtual walk. So if anybody could go to virtualwalkforthehomeless.org, you can make a donation there. Um, we're hoping to uh, respond not just to the existing needs, but or see uh, responding to needs down the road. So that would be my plug and I appreciate it. <laughs> and we have um, resources and opportunities for people to stay connected virtually and eventually again in person. Um, so you can find out information about the coalition at mahomeless.org as well as on um, our social media channels on Instagram and homelessness MA and on Facebook and Twitter MA homeless. And I would just plug uh, a website that we've put up called uh, rentfreeze.org, www.rentfreeze.org. And that will uh, give you an opportunity to show support um, for a rent freeze and uh, comment on draft legislation. And it will also connect you to the housing uh, homes for all movement in Massachusetts. Um, so check it out. Awesome. Well, again, thank, thank, thank all three of you for joining this afternoon. Uh, and thank, thank you for all the, the great work that you've been doing. Thank, thank, you. thank you so much, John. Thank, thank you, you all.